Porphyries are rare enough to misunderstood medical conditions caused by mutations in enzymes in the heme synthesis pathway. In this lesson, we're going to look at an in-depth overview of one of the most prominent porphyry conditions known as acute intermittent porphyria. So to begin, I just want to look at a broad overview of porphyry con conditions in general. We can categorize porphyry conditions by symptoms. There's one class of porphyry conditions with abdominal pain and neuropsychiatric symptoms. These are known as the neurovisceral porphyry conditions. And there's another class of porphyry conditions with skin manifestations. And these ones are called cutaneous porphyry conditions. In the class of neurovisceral porphyry conditions, we have acute intermittent porphyria, hereditary copper porphyria, variagit porphyria, and ADP. And in the cutaneous class of porphyry conditions, we have porphyria cutanea tarda, hereditary copper porphyria, variagit porphyria, EPP, CEP, and HEP. So you can notice there's some types of porphyry that are common between both classes, but what I really want to focus on in this lesson is acute intermittent porphyria. So what is acute intermittent porphyria or AIP? Acute intermittent porphyria is a condition caused by a heterozygous mutation of the gene porphyrinogen deaminase or PBGD. This enzyme has other names like uroporphyrinogen 1 synthase or hydroxymethylbilane synthase. But essentially what happens is there is an issue in the porphobalinogen deaminase enzyme in the heme synthesis pathway that leads to a buildup of porphobalinogen in the pathway. If you want more details on the heme synthesis pathway and an overview of other porphyria conditions, please check out my lessons on those topics. With regards to porphobalinogen deaminase in AIP, there's actually been more than 400 mutations found in this gene. And what happens is one of the porphobalinogen deaminase gene alleles becomes affected, and then the remaining porphobalinogen deaminase activity is due to the unaffected allele. So you still have activity of the porphyrinogen deaminase enzyme, but it's just at a reduced amount. And the porphyrinogen deaminase gene leads to two variants, one hepatic and one a systemic variant. And what happens in AIP is due to the hepatic variant. And AIP is a autosomal dominant condition, but has low penetrance, which means that it gets passed on generation to generation, but we don't necessarily see the phenotypic effects in every individual. And AIP is the second most common type of porphyria, second to porphyria cutanea tarda. And because we lose function of porphobinogen deaminase enzyme, we get a backup of precursors, which means we get elevations in amino levulinic acid or ALA and porphobinogen or PBG. And the elevations in ALA and PBG are actually what cause the acute attacks of neurovisceral symptoms. And the acute attacks can develop over hours to days and may even last for weeks. So they, these attacks can be debilitating. And the epidemiology of AIP is as follows. There's usually one carrier per 2,000 persons. It's an autosomal dominant condition, as we mentioned earlier, so it's equally inherited between women and men, but it's more likely to manifest in women than men. And we're going to talk about why that is in a couple of slides. And it's more common in people of Northern European descent. So AIP has the onset generally in the third to fourth decade of life, and attacks of acute intermittent porphyria are extremely rare prior to puberty. The triggering factors for AIP include the following. It includes medications, which we'll talk about in more detail in the next slide, sex hormones, which is why porphyria attacks are extremely rare prior to puberty, and the sex hormones specifically are estrogen and progesterone, which is why women are more likely to manifest AIP than men. Starvation and reduced caloric intake can also be a trigger for porphyria attacks. Alcohol and smoking can also be a trigger, and psychological stress as well. So what are some of the medications that can trigger porphyria attacks in acute intermittent porphyria? So some unsafe medications with AIP include the following. Anesthetic, so thiopental and ketamine. Anticonvulsants like phenytoin and valproic acid. Antibiotics like nitrofurantoin, rifampin, and sulfa drugs. Anxiolytics like clonazepam. Diclofenac and maybe some other NSAIDs. Other unsafe medications include oral contraceptive pills because they contain estrogen and progesterone. And this can be one of the common triggers for young women when they first receive a diagnosis of acute intermittent porphyria. They might actually begin an oral contraceptive pill and they might come in with neurovisceral type of symptoms. And this can actually be the cause, OCPs. Diuretics like spironolactone can also trigger AIP and others like tamoxifen and metoclopramide. So the pathophysiology is all due to the heme synthesis pathway and in particular the ALAS1 enzyme or amino levulinic acid synthase 1. So in the heme synthesis pathway, we use glycine and succinyl-CoA with the enzyme ALAS1, and this leads to essentially the production of aminolevulinic acid, porphyrinogen, and hydroxymethylbilane. And this is the enzyme that's affected in acute intermittent porphyria, porphyrinogen deaminase. So you can imagine that if you're affecting this enzyme, we're going to have a buildup of these prior 
precursors. And that's exactly what happens. But this ALAS1 is the rate limiting enzyme of the heme synthesis pathway. So ALAS1 activity and function is going to dictate the heme synthesis pathway. And the problem is, is that in AIP, we have reduced activity of porphyrinogen deaminase. So if we have increased or overactivation of ALAS1, we're going to push this pathway forward and this is going to be act as a bottleneck essentially. And what's going to happen is we're going to have a backup of porphyrinogen and ALA, which are the causes of the neurovisceral symptoms. So whatever regulates ALAS1 is going to determine whether a person has neurovisceral symptoms or not. One of the first main regulators of ALAS1 is the free heme pool within our body. So we have a theoretical free heme pool in our body. So essentially at the end of the heme synthesis pathway, we've created heme. We've created the end product, which is going to negatively regulate and negatively feedback on this enzyme to stop making more heme. So heme is going to inhibit this enzyme. However, anything that utilizes heme is going to activate ALS1. And one of these is CYP enzyme production. So if we need to make CYP enzymes or CYP 450 enzymes in our liver, for instance, we need to use heme to make those enzymes. So we're going to deplete heme and we're going to actually need to make more heme. And that means it's going to lead to the activation of this enzyme. So that's not going to be good. And meds, like some of the medications we talked about earlier, can be why they are activators or unsafe for AIP because they can lead to increased CYP 450 enzyme production. Progesterone can directly act on ALAS1 to activate it, and it can also lead to increased CYP production as well, which all is going to activate the ALAS1 enzyme. Alcohol and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, are going to essentially lead to increased production of CYP450 enzymes, which is going to lead to activation of ALAS1. PGC1-alpha is also a direct activator of ALAS1. And glucagon and starvation both act to activate PGC1-alpha. So that's the reason why starvation and fasting and caloric reduction can lead to the activation of, of ALAS1 and cause neurovisceral attacks in AIP patients. But insulin and glucose both inhibit PGC1-alpha, which means they both inhibit ALAS1. And glucose itself seems to directly inhibit ALAS1 as well. Other things that lead to the degradation of heme include metabolic stress. So metabolic stress can activate heme oxygenase. So essentially heme oxygenase can become activated, increasing the heme catabolism pathway, which means it's essentially siphoning away heme from the free heme pool, leading to activation of ALS1 as well. So all of these things can regulate ALAS1. And the ones that activate ALAS1 are the triggers that essentially cause these neurovisceral attacks. And the ones that inhibit ALAS1 are the ones that can actually inhibit a neurovisceral attack. So these are very important to understand. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of AIP? It's a highly variable clinical presentation. Most never develop symptoms, which is called latent acute intermittent porphyria. But with some individuals, they get intermittent acute attacks. These attacks can be life-threatening, and these attacks can develop over hours to days. And the classic triad of AIP signs and symptoms includes abdominal pain, seizures, and hyponatremia, but there are many other signs and symptoms. Some of the gastrointestinal and associated symptoms include the abdominal pain, which is the most common symptom. The pain is often severe and constant and is described as cramping in nature. There can also be chest pain, back pain, and pain in extremities. There can be nausea and vomiting constipation and bloating, and essentially the AIP can look like an ileus, so you can get abdominal distension with this. And diarrhea is the least common symptom, but you can get diarrhea. And if we were to compare prevalence of diarrhea and constipation, constipation is much more common. With regards to neurologic symptoms, these include severe fatigue and difficulty concentrating, peripheral neuropathy, can be a common symptom and this can actually precede the abdominal pain so individuals can describe peripheral neuropathy even before they get the abdominal pain and we call these types of peripheral neuropathy patchy paresthesia so they get little paresthesias in different patches on their body they can also have muscle weakness generally speaking it's proximal upper limbs progressing to lower limbs and quadriplegia and respiratory paralysis can occur as well. And there is some question of whether if they were to progress to this severe event like quadriplegia or respiratory paralysis, is it reversible with treatment or not? We're going to talk about what the treatment is in a moment. And there's also psychiatric symptoms as well, behavioral and personality changes, psychosis and hallucinations. And other rare symptoms of AIP include fever, 
and sensory loss. So the, some of the physical signs of AIP include red urine color. So you can see here, normal urine color, there is a red urine color and it looks like almost a red wine that's diluted with water. So it's almost a, a wine, red wine type color of urine. This can be an early sign of an attack. So you might actually see the change in urine color even at the early onset of an attack. The thing is, is that ALA and PBG are colorless. So what causes the red color? Well, it's actually that PBG degrades to porphobilin, which has a brownish color. And uroporphyrins can also be produced from PBG as well. Uroporphyrins are also reddish to brown in color. This is why we see the red color of uh, urine in attacks of AIP. Physical examination includes the following. So generally speaking, tachycardia is the most common physical sign. They can also see hypertension. And when we palpate the abdomen in a patient with an acute attack of AIP, they actually don't complain of rebound tenderness. And there's generally minimal abdominal tenderness on palpation, which is interesting. So they are describing a constant severe pain, but there's no uh, rebound tenderness and there's minimal abdominal tenderness on palpation. So AIP can be a devastating condition. So there are many future complications with regards to this condition. Oftentimes, future complications include chronic pain, depression and anxiety, chronic liver inflammation. And because of the chronic liver inflammation, there's actually an increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma with acute intermittent porphyria. And it generally occurs after the age of 50. So there's this underlying chronic liver inflammation in patients with acute intermittent porphyria. And this chronic low-lying uh, inflammation of the liver can lead to an increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And they don't necessarily have to have cirrhosis to be at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. And these complications are similar to those in other porphyria conditions as well. Some of the laboratory findings in AIP include hyponatremia. So that was one of the classic triad of AIP. Again, it's very common. And it appears to be due to SIADH, or syndrome of inappropriate ADH or antidiuretic hormone. We can also see hypomagnesemia and hypercalcemia. And again, we see that chronic transaminitis, so a chronic elevation in liver enzymes. So how do we diagnose AIP? AIP is diagnosed during an attack. We want to assess it during one of these neurovisceral attacks. We can look at the urine. So we can do a spot urine, which shows increased urinary porphyrinogen amino lipolinic acid in the porphyrins like uroporphyrin and copperporphyrin. Generally, we can see 20 to 200 milligrams of, uh, per day of porphyrinogen during an attack. Total urinary porphyrin excretion can be up to 1,000 micrograms per day during an attack. But if we see increased urinary porphyrins, but a normal PBG and ALA, we got to consider other types of porphyria or liver disease. We can look at the serum in individuals with AIP during an attack. We're going to see ALA and PBG elevated. And we can also look at a stool sample to delineate the diagnosis even further. And we're going to see essentially normal fecal porphyrin levels in AIP. This is what's going to distinguish this type of porphyria from other types of porphyria because we see markedly elevated porphyrin levels in active cases of HCP and VP. So again, the stool sample is what's going to help us determine that this is a diagnosis of AIP. And you could also do a erythrocyte PBGD activity measurement. So once we've made the diagnosis, how do we treat it? Well, the treatment of acute intermittent porphyria is the same as the other acute porphyrias like hereditary copper porphyria and variegate porphyria. So these include identifying and eliminating triggers and exacerbating factors like those medications, other triggers like we've talked about earlier. And if you can eliminate the triggers and exacerbating factors, you might actually lead the individual to not having any more attacks, which we classify as a latent AIP, but a minority of heterozygotes will continue to have recurrent attacks even after elimination and identification of triggers. During acute attacks for treatment, we can use hemin and glucose loading. This makes sense. Again, hemin and glucose are both inhibitors of ALAS1 enzyme. So it leads to an inhibited ALAS1 activity. We can also use pain control like morphine and hydromorphone. And we can use beta blockers for some of the autonomic symptoms like tachycardia. And we can use chlorpromazine and ondansetron for nausea and vomiting. And in rare cases, we might use gonadotropin-releasing hormone analogs to suppress ovulation, where we find that the trigger is actually hormones like estrogen and progesterone. So if you want to learn more about other porphyria conditions, please check out my overview of porphyria conditions lesson. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.